there's a place God is calling you it's where he meets with you it's where he wants to talk with you there's a place for every single one of you Jesus has a special space it's reserved for just you Many of you right now, tonight, you came to this building. God is calling you back to this space. He's calling you to the back to the place of intimacy. He's calling you to the place of communion. He's calling you to the place where you can hear his voice. Feel the presence of God. request I've ever heard in the Bible. word tonight. Thank you for this moment. We come into your presence, God. Continue to speak to us, Lord. Continue to speak to us. Thank you, worship team. You all can be seated. Thank you very much. Let's just stay in an attitude of worship tonight. There's a precious presence in this place. Let's just stay connected to God. This man isn't done yet. He's still worshiping God. You see, you can worship him whatever you want in this service. He's right here. You know, I don't know why church got so, in, for over the years, church has just gotten so um, organized, but in a bad way. <laughs> you know you can stand up and shout anytime you want to, right? Because he's a good God. You know you can stand up, you know you can lift your hands anytime you want to. He's a good God. Jesus is here with us tonight. I'm going to talk with you. If I could have one of those abundance books, could I just have one of the abundance books from somebody? I'm sorry I didn't ask for this ahead of time, but thank you if you could just give me one of the books. Luke 5, 16. But Jesus often withdrew, thank you, to lonely places and prayed. Let's read that again, Luke 5, 16. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, and he prayed. I wanted to make sure I say this correct. We're talking about principle six tonight, if you have the book, but if you don't, we're obviously talking about prayer. We're going to talk about meeting with God because prayer gives you unlimited access to the abundant life. Let me say it again. Prayer gives you unlimited access to the abundant life. Jesus, Luke 5, 16, often withdrew to lonely places and he prayed. Now, if it was often, it wasn't every once in a while. Does anybody agree with that? So if it's often, it's not every once in a while. Can somebody say amen? amen. So Jesus needed prayer. He went to meet with his God. He went to meet with his Father. And it said he often went. See, Psalm 91 is one of our favorite chapters in the Bible. And we love quoting this chapter for many things in our life. A thousand can fall at my left hand, 10,000 at my right, but it's not going to come near you. Anybody ever said that before? The pestilence is going to come, right? It's not going to touch you. Even though the arrow that flies by day, it will not touch me, right? How many have prayed it over a family member for protection before? Here's the deal. 
Every single one of those promises is contingent on verse 1. Those who live in the secret place of the Most High. Another version says, those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. These promises are for dwellers, not visitors. If you live in God's presence, it's different than visiting his presence. It's like people who come to church. There are some people who come and visit a church, and then there's those who are the church. It's like we can do that with prayer. We can do it with God. We can visit God. We come and we visit him on a Sunday. Hopefully the pastor gives us a good enough word that we had a good visit. But if we don't like what the pastor spoke, we don't even like that visit. But you're not taking Jesus home with you. He says that I want you to take a hammer and a nail, and I want you to build a dwelling. I want you not to just come and visit me. I don't need you to send a postcard every once in a while. I don't want you to call me from long distance. I want you to actually show up to my front door. I want you to pound on the door, and I want you to keep on knocking until I open it because you want my presence. Jesus often went away, the Bible says, and withdrew. He lived in the presence of God. So this is the first question i got to ask you. Are you a dweller or are you a visitor? Because we dwellers, when they quote the Bible and they quote the promises, something happens when they do that. Visitors, when they quote the Bible and they quote the promises, nothing happens for them. It doesn't mean God loves you any less. God has mercy. Of course he shows mercy. But you're not living the abundant life when you're not a dweller. You're not living the abundant life when you're not constantly plugged into an unending resource of love, an unending resource of joy, an unending resource of peace. There's a difference between coming and trying to charge up every once in a while and you're running out all week long just like your cell phone or you stay plugged in because the church goes with you. The place goes with you. You are a dweller. Jesus is everywhere you are. It said that Jesus would withdraw and withdrew to lonely places. You see, we look at loneliness as something that's an enemy. And it's true. There is a spirit of orphan that is on people. There are people that I know that have been raised by two parents yet are orphans. They were never fathered. They were never mothered. It's true that you can feel lonely. There are people in this building that even though you're in the midst of this crowd, you feel alone. It's possible to be around people but have such a deep-seated loneliness that you still feel by yourself even though it's somebody sitting on your right and your left. But I'm not talking about that loneliness. I'm talking about God actually draws you into places where you feel like you're by yourself. Let me tell you why. Because it's not popular to be a disciple. It's not popular to serve God with all of your life. It's not popular to be praying and fasting all the time. People want to eat their food. It's not popular to not be going out and doing crazy stuff. You're no fun anymore. It's not popular to not be on the side of the street running with the boys being an idiot anymore. Because you know what happens? When you start improving your life, just like the crabs in the bucket, they want to pull you down because they can't get to where you are and you're exposing the sin that's in their life by by living godly. They hate it. See, the world will hate it when you begin to succeed. The world hates it when God begins to touch you. The world hates it when God begins to give you a breakthrough. The world hates it. The enemy hates it that you're doing something. He hates it you started a DG. He hates it you're going to Holy Wars. He hates it. People can't take it when you're not even preaching at them anymore, but your life is shining a light on their darkness. It said that he went to lonely places. You see, it's in the place that God hides you that he works with you. Let me say that again. It's the places where you feel no one sees you. It's the places where you're hidden. It's the places nobody knows what you're saying but God. It's the places that you go to that you feel, my God, I became a Christian. I didn't know I signed up for this, but there's a desert or a wilderness. Remember, when Jesus was baptized, he was not put on a throne. He was led into a wilderness. 
Think about how nature even acts when it comes to hiding you. Rabbits take 35 days for pregnancy before they birth. Dogs, 60 days. A person, 9 months. A horse, 12 months. Elephants, 22 months. What is the pattern here? The bigger the thing you're going to birth, the longer it needs to be in hiding. Jesus was anonymous for 30 years. We get one small story about him when he's 12 years old. But he's anonymous. He's just among us. But for 30 years, he's in hiding under the hand of his father. Why? Because he had something so big to birth that for the three years he actually did something, he did more that John said, if I were to write down everything that he did, it would fill all the books of all the libraries of all of the earth in three years. How did he get that? It's because the work was not done in those three years. The work was done in the 30 that he was hidden. Nobody wants to be in hiding. Who wants to seem anonymous? Nobody's following me on Instagram. I don't have an image. Yeah, that's right. God's trying to kill your image so you can finally show him. He's trying to kill your image so he can finally show him. The Bible constantly relates and, you know, there's different things in the Bible that it relates your life to. Uh, the Bible relates your life to a seed. It's got to die. The Bible relates your life to water. It's, the Bible relates your life in different ways to a fire. Jeremiah talks about it in the word and the word is different things. But one of the, the Bible calls you a tree, Psalm 92, you know. But the Bible also relates you to wine. There's five basic steps that happen in wine. Number one. The harvest. The Bible says, Colossians 1, that he literally took you and he plucked you out of the kingdom of darkness. And he translated you into his marvelous light. In one move, you got saved. And it wasn't just a prayer. Your actual address in the spirit shifted. You moved houses. You vacated the house of darkness you were in, that the enemy was your landlord, and you moved into a different kingdom. Now you're not just a member of a church. You're actually called a citizen of heaven. Your citizenship shifted. I don't care if you're Hispanic first, if you're African American first. I don't care if you think you're an American first or you're from Mexico first. That's not your first citizenship. My first citizenship is I'm a child of God. I'm a part of a city. Heaven is my home. And then I have a second citizenship that is here. I'm an American. But because my first citizenship is not here, it's in heaven, I don't abide by the same dictates or the same problems that Americans go through. I'm not an American first. That's why I don't worry when the economy goes crazy. It's not going to affect me. I don't care if the gas goes to $12 a gallon. God always has provided all of my needs. Why are you talking about it? You see, Christians, we begin to talk like the world. We're acting like the world. We're talking like the world. We're worried about the same thing. Well, who's going to be in office? Who's not? Listen, how about the only God who never got voted in and nobody can vote him out? How about the only God who never shifts or changes? How about there's a throne up there and it doesn't matter who's in office? God shifts people like he shifts chess pieces. He'll put people in and put people out. My question is, are you right with God? Are you a dweller? Are you taking these steps? God plucks you out of the darkness. And the second thing he does after harvesting, the second one is called the pressing. They take the olives and they begin to crush them. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You got saved and somebody told you this is going to be the happiest, easiest life you ever had. You went to a church, they were like, man, just be a Christian. And you came to the altar because they sold you on the benefits. They didn't actually tell you about being a disciple, which means you got to take up your cross. What they should have done is give you a cross because when you truly get saved, God hands you a cross. Here's the deal. Some people are not ready for it, so the cross crushes them. But when you truly realize what God has given you, yes, there's going to be eternal life. Yes, there's going to be peace like you've never known. Yes, you're going to prosper in ways you've never known. Yes, you are a favorite of God now. Yes, you don't have to be subject to the enemy anymore. There's amazing benefits. But Jesus never, ever used the benefits to win one soul. Did you ever know that? 
Remember the rich young ruler that comes to him and says, what do I got to do to inherit the kingdom of God? This is the greatest giver. This man's got a lot of money. Now, in our churches, if a man like that would come to our church and be wearing a suit, we'd make sure we saved him a seat on the front row. We'd make sure. Why? Because we're hoping he's going to give to us. We better take care of him. And you're praying, if you invited him to church, that the pastor won't preach anything that's too intense. Jesus looks at him and he says, well, you got to sell everything you got. It's the only thing that's keeping me from you. Matter of fact, Jesus wanted to be closer to the man than the man wanted to be closer to him. Jesus wanted him more than the man wanted Jesus. And he said, if you'll just remove this, because money is not a problem, but this man loved money. He had an issue with it. There are other disciples that followed Jesus. They had no money. They had no problem with money. Joseph, remember, he actually bought Jesus' tomb. He was a wealthy man, followed him the whole time, had no issue with money. He used it for the kingdom of God. Money's just a tool. It's nothing wrong with it. It's just a tool. But if it's in the tool of the hands of somebody who has greed, who can't let go of money, then God can't let you let go of what you need. So watch what's going to happen. Jesus looks at him and he says this. He says, this is separating you from me. Let it go. It says the man, listen to the words in the Bible. The man walks away dejected and sad. Pastors at that point, the elders would be like, Pastor, what are you doing? Let's go get him. And what, then we would, we'd be running with him with the Bible, right? And we'd be like, oh, I know he said that, but uh, it also says in Proverbs that those who lend to the poor will also give to the Lord. It also says we'd be trying to give every promise we can to reconvince him to come back. Jesus let him go away dejected because Jesus never, ever used a benefit in order to have people follow him. He says, if you want to eat my flesh, if you want to drink my blood, if you want to take up a cross, come on and follow me. The abundant life is found in the cross, but there's got to be a crushing that happens. Some of y'all got saved and automatically you're like, this is not what I signed up for. How about Noah? Noah was the only man who found grace in God's sight, so he was rewarded with a storm. He's rewarded with a storm that lasts almost two years. But the rain did stop. And he did have a rock that he stood on. And he did create a new future. How about Joseph? Joseph received a promise, and he was rewarded with a pit in a prison cell. He gets the promise, thank God you spoke to me, and now I get a pit in a prison cell. That's how God rewards you. But he did get out of the prison. He was ascended to the second place of power. He did actually fulfill the promise. What about Moses? Moses heard God's voice and was rewarded by being hated and rejected by his own people as Pharaoh consistently denied the release of God's people. He's hated by his own people. He's rewarded with hate. Then he's rewarded with the desert. For 40 years, that should have taken 40 days. But God did do miracles. God was there with him. And the next generation did go to the promised land. David was a shepherd who received the promise to be a king. So God rewarded him by making him run for his life from a king who had a demon. Thanks, God. You see in a pattern... But he did get to the throne, and he was called a man after God's own heart. Jesus was sent as the promise, walking in flesh. He wasn't given a promise. He was the promise. He was the promise, walked in flesh, wrapped up, walking around in flesh. The Word was God, and the Word was with God, John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and walked among us. He was there, and he was rewarded by being born in a barn because there was no room for him in the end. Then he was driven into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Then he was given over to a cross that he didn't deserve. Then he was crucified on that cross and buried in the earth. But he did raise from the dead. I said he did raise up from the dead. I said he did receive the promise. And he got the name above every name that every name that should bow to the... Paul was given an amazing encounter with Jesus being knocked off a donkey. He saw a vision of Jesus so clear nobody had ever seen that before. And he was rewarded by being beaten with rods three times, thrown into prison constantly, and sought after to kill. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, most of those books, in chains. 
Sound like a life you want? Welcome to Christianity. But God's got to press you because until he presses you, the anointing can't flow out of you. He can't get what he wants. You see, you got to get with God. You got to get with God in this place where he begins to press you. He begins to press. You don't know why he's doing some of the things he's doing. You don't understand why something's going on. You don't know why you're still single. You thought you'd be married by now. You have no idea. I thought being a pastor was going to be great, but you're regretting. You'd say, man, this devil, I must have heard wrong from God. These people are crazy. You don't understand why God called you to what he called you to, but I'm telling you something. What's going on? You can't see it, but stuff is coming out of you that's going to touch your family. It's going to touch the generation. It's going to touch. You see, in the Bible, there's places called Altars. Altars. Through the Old Testament, altars. If you wanted to hear God's voice, there was a requirement. The altar demands a sacrifice. Say that. The altar demands, one more time, the altar demands a sacrifice. So this is what would happen. Until they would sacrifice, sometimes thousands of animals. Noah, for instance, gets off of the ark. He makes a sacrifice. Here's God's voice. The rainbow shows up. Here's the promise. Solomon is dedicating the temple of the Lord. It said that he dedicated so many animals. There was thousands. They couldn't even count how many he did. And at the end of it, he prays a prayer, and God sends his fire down. His glory hits so strong that nobody can even stand anymore. But it was after the fire was lit. The altar demands a sacrifice. And when the incense went up, his voice came. It hasn't changed today. Let me show you this. There are times of mercy when you didn't do a sacrifice, but God meets with you. Like Jacob, who was on a run after stealing his brother's inheritance, and he's running for his life, and it says he comes to a place called Luz, and he lays down because that's what you do when you don't want to face life circumstances, and you don't want to face what's coming against you. You take a nap. It's too much out there. My mom's too much. My sister's too much. This is too much. My job, everything. I just can't. Let me just go to bed takes a nap and it said listen to this Woo! it said he puts his head on a rock puts his head on the rock he didn't know but the rock was Jesus he puts his head on a rock and he sees a vision of heaven of the ladder going up and coming down angels ascending and descending he wakes up and he says my God I didn't know that the place I was running was actually the house of God you had me somewhere I didn't even know where I was you see some of y'all think you're going through the worst time of your life but what's actually happening is the greatest promotion you've ever had <laughs> sit down sit down stop acting crazy Jesus had moments, and you know what would happen? Anytime God would speak without a sacrifice, it says these men would build an altar. Why would they build an altar at that moment? Because, we, because God only came in short moments of time. He only came, and when he spoke, it was so special. It was so unique. It was so amazing. They had to mark the spot. So they would build altars so that, listen, two things. Other people could come by, and when they would walk by on a journey, they'd say, God was here. God was here. And they would burn a sacrifice. God was here. Don't you? You see, parents, you need to have altars all over your life. Haven't you had victories, mom? Haven't you had victories, dad? You see, your kids are going to come. I just said, your kids are going to come to the altars of your victories. And they're going to say, my God, if dad. There's altars. And it said that they come and they mark a spot. One time Joshua was going through a river, and in the middle of the river, God tells him to stop and make an altar. In the middle of the test, he says, I want you to stop here and praise me. Oh, that's a different sermon. But you got to understand the time to praise God isn't when you've won. The time to praise him is in the middle. The time to praise him is in the middle. The time to praise him is right now. That's a different sermon. Come back on Palm Sunday. Look at what the Bible says. Moses says, Exodus 3, 2 through 4. This is so good. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now, look at these words, turn aside 
and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, when the Lord saw that he broke his attention from that and he put his attention on him, when the Lord saw that he stopped going this direction and said, God, you got my attention, when he saw the inward turn of the heart, when he said, he spoke, Moses! Now, the reason why it's written two times is not because he said it two times. It's because the writer's putting an unction on the word. So it wasn't Moses, Moses. It was Moses! Do you remember in the book of Revelations when it said they cry, holy, holy, holy? It's actually originally written nine times. We only read it three times. It's originally written nine. Why? Because the pitch of what they're saying when they're looking at God on his throne, the angels that are coming, every time they open their eyes, the seraphim and the cherubim, they're looking at them, ah! And it's so, it, nine times, oh, ah. He says, Moses! And he says, here I am. He said, I'm going to certainly be with you. He gives them the promise. Please understand, there is a burning bush in every single one of your lives every day. There's a place where there's a burning bush every single day. God is waiting for you to turn your attention. He just, it's an inward turn of the heart. It's a focus that shifts. It's, I know I could do this, but I'm going to turn off Netflix. And I'm not going to be with you. I know I could do this. I know that I'm, the voice is really great right now, but I haven't heard your voice. The voice is really great, but I haven't heard your voice. So I'm turning off the TV and I got to, there's a shift. There's a turn of the heart. Have you met with God today? Or were you depending on this service to give you God? Because let me tell you something. He goes home with you too. Did you know that? He's with you when you leave. This is not the only place that something happens. Matter of fact, the greatest victories of your life are supposed to happen outside of these doors. So that when you come inside of these doors, it's a massive celebration. It's a massive time of just praising God. We're supposed to be having praise parties that are uncontainable because of victories that are going on outside of this building. So look at what he says. He's on the mountain. And this is so powerful what God says. This is incredible. He says at the end, he said, I'm going to give you this sign. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God and return to this mountain. You're going to go there, and then I'm going to make you come back right here in this spot. You see, there's something about a place where God speaks. God will bring you back to the place he spoke. He said, I don't want you going anywhere else. You see, a lot of people think that Egypt was delivered so they could go to the promised land. That's not right. Egypt was delivered so that they could come to the promiser. His name is Jesus. He was waiting for them. Listen, he was waiting for them on a mountain. Let those words sink in. God is waiting on the mountain. Return to this spot. Pause. Rewind. We're at Abraham, Genesis 22. The same mountain called Horeb, where Moses saw the burning bush, there was another man who walked up the mountain called Abram. Abraham, who had his name changed, walking up with his boy to slay him on top of the mountain. And it was on the mountain that, remember, God never had intended for Isaac to die. He always just wanted Abraham to die. And it was on top of the mountain that the man's will died, the man's pride died, and he was willing to do anything because he feared God. And there was an altar there, and God loves places. There's something special about geographical locations. I'm trying to tell you, if you do not have a geographical location, a place where you can meet with God, the same mountain he says, you're going to come back to this because this is a place I spoke. And it says they came out of the wilderness, Exodus 26, verse 30. Look at this. Moses is on top of the mountain, and it says, God speaks, set up the tabernacle according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. Let me read one more, Exodus 27, 8, and I'll explain this. The altar, he's talking about something, must be hollow, made of planks. Build it just as you were shown on the mountain. Listen. Before Moses goes down from the mountain, from meeting with God, God has to remind him, don't trust any feeling you have that you didn't get here. You cannot trust any plan that you've gotten 
if you didn't get it on the mountain. You know why? Because when you come down from the mountain, you encounter life again. You encounter sick kids again. You encounter a marriage that might not be perfect again. When you come out of God's presence, when you come out of meeting with him on top of the mountain, you're confronted with things in your life. He says, I don't, listen, when you get off of this mountain, there's some stuff about to happen. But I want you to remember what I told you right here. The only plans you can trust, the only downloads you can trust, the only things you can trust is when you're in the presence of God. Why? Because when you're in the presence of God, your fears become nothing. The things you're afraid of, you're not afraid anymore. When God's face becomes, man, if, who, who knows what I'm talking about? Who has been there? Who has touched God's face? When God's face becomes real, all of your problems seem like they're nothing. You don't even mention them. It's not worth mentioning when God makes himself real. You can't even speak, let alone complain. When the presence of God comes, it stills you. It makes you peaceful. It stills your soul. It doesn't rile you up. But when God's power comes, it makes you want to prophesy. It makes you want to pray. It makes you want to lay hands. But when the presence of God, it stills you. Every fear is gone. Every problem, it's not a problem. You're not worried. That's why you can trust what he tells you. Because, listen, we learned this in the Holy Ghost series. You can never trust a decision you make in fear. You can never, ever trust a decision you made in response to pressure. And you can never understand. Remember, the Holy Spirit leads by peace. Satan pushes. The Holy Spirit leads you by peace. Satan pushes. Don't ever make an important decision when you feel pressured. You see, when you're on that mountain, you have a different perspective. You're above everything that used to be above you. When you're in God's presence, you have a different perspective. You're above everything that used to be above you. You believe that you can walk on the stuff you used to drown in. You believe that maybe angels' food can come down from heaven. You believe every story that's in the Bible. I do believe that you walked over there and plucked out a fish and there was a coin in its mouth. I do believe that you were able to feed 5,000 men, not to mention women and children. I do believe. Why? Because when God makes himself real to you, you're filled with faith. Faith. Look at this, your perspective shifts. Let me tell you uh, great news. Nothing actually needs to change with your life around you for your life to shift. Nothing needs to change around you for your life to shift. All that needs to shift is your perspective. Can I prove this to you? Elisha, remember, he's standing there, he's on the porch, and there's over 120,000 people that are around him. His servant Gehazi's there, remember this? Gehazi's there with him. He's there, they're there, they're seeing the exact same thing. And one man is going, oh, this is awesome. And the other man, Gehazi, is going, we got to get out of here. They're both seeing the same situation. What does he pray? God, would you open his eyes? Nothing needs to shift around you. And then he saw there were more angels and people for him than were against him. You see, nothing needs to shift with the family that you have. Nothing has to shift. And they don't have to talk to you better, actually, for you to be happy. Do you know they actually don't have to apologize for you to be happy? Do you know that they actually are not supposed to control your joy? Do you know that they actually aren't supposed to control your peace? Do you know that nothing has to shift around you? Mary comes to the tomb. Jesus isn't there. The stone's been rolled away. And it says she, she falls down in front of the tomb. She falls down in front of the tomb and she's weeping. The angel of God is sitting on the tomb looking at her. The Bible says she goes up to the tomb. She falls down and she's weeping. The angel of God is over there looking at her. Her perspective is she's seeing an empty tomb. The angel sees Jesus behind her, and he says, why are you crying? You see, she's turned this way, looking at the empty tomb. The angel sees Jesus. It's all about perspective. He says, would you turn around? Why are you crying? And then Jesus says her name, Mary. And we all know the story. She grabs him. Why? Because maybe you're looking at the situation as an empty tomb, or are you seeing Jesus who's right behind you, who rose from the dead? I don't know if you're looking at your family and you've given up on your brother. Why you done that? Do you remember when Jesus comes to Lazarus? Oh. Remember Jesus comes to Lazarus and he's weeping and he's crying because he's so upset that he's standing there. He is the resurrection and the life. But they're talking like Lazarus is dead. 
But death for you is just sleeping for Jesus. So Jesus looks at him and says, um, come out, Lazarus. And look at this. This is what happened with some of y'all when you got saved. You came out still jumping in your grave clothes. And Jesus says some of the most powerful words. Go and unwrap him. Take those grave clothes off of him. He's not dead anymore. This man is living. Some of y'all need to know that even though your brother isn't here yet, even though your mama isn't here yet, even though your daughter's son isn't here yet, they're just sleeping, baby. They're not dead. They're not out. <sighs> Moses is fasting, guys. He's on top of a mountain. Now remember, until the fire of the, the sacrifice comes, you can't get the glory. So what's going on? It says that he's fasting for 40 days. Remember, he went up to the top of the mountain. Watch this. And it said there was a cloud and fire on the mountain. God made the whole mountain an altar. You actually can find, archaeologists have found, the rocks are burned on the outside, on the mountain. And when they crack it, there's nothing on the inside. It's all fine. Because it's proven there was fire on the mountain. Now, wait a minute. What was the sacrifice? A man who was fully devoted to God's will, who was fasting and praying. So the altar was the mountain, and the man became the sacrifice. And it says that when he came down after 40 days of fasting and praying, he didn't look worse. He looked better than everybody else. His face was shining. Why? Because glory is actually edible. Yeah. Glory is actually edible. It actually affects your body. It actually affects you. He wasn't eating. He wasn't drinking. But he came down looking more youthful. He came down looking more powerful. You see, ma'am, can I tell you if you're single, you don't need a man who's got everything going on. He wears the great pants because he's empty on the inside. You need a man who knows how to tap into the glory. You need a man who can walk around. He's thriving, not going worse, thriving, because when you meet with God, you encounter abundance. I'm talking to you about the place. Abundance has a location. Abundance has a location. It's in the secret place of God. Oh, my Lord. Ezekiel 3.3, 3, he said that he, your scroll, Lord, I tasted it, and it tasted like honey. Psalm 19, 9 through 10, the laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They're more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They're sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. Psalm 119, 103 through 104, how sweet your words taste to me. They're sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. You can eat. Taste and see God is good. Moses comes down from that, and it says he comes down, and he automatically encounters some issues. Because this is what happens when you get in God's presence. You come down, and your child is sick and coughing. So that takes a little bit of what you just got. Then your wife uh, says something about you you don't like. So that's going to take a little bit more patience. You're going to have to give a lot for that one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, then your mother-in-law calls you, oh, well, God, we better just, uh. and here's the problem. Because you're still coming from a cup trying to do it on your own. When God put that picture up of an ocean, when God has an ocean for you to drink out of that never, ever stops flowing. You see, you're coming a cup at a time. You're trying to do it, and after a few times, after the first hour of your day, you're ready to go back into God's presence. But there's a river. There's actually a well that never runs dry. There's actually a flowing. You can take God's house with you. You can take it with you. You see, God has to tell Moses, get back up here. Some of y'all, you need to be told that. You need to get back up to God's presence. You need to get back to the mountain. You need to get out of the situation you're at. You need to stop arguing with your sister. You need to stop trying to preach to your kids. And you need to get with God. You need to hear the Lord. You need to get direction. You need to get a download. You got to get back up to the mountain, baby. You got to come back to the place where you can cry. You got to come back to the place you can be honest with God and vulnerable. What other places like God's presence? You got to come back to the place where he's going to speak to you in a way that nobody understands you like God, but he will speak to you. You got to come back home. You got to come back home to God's presence. Listen, y'all, I was going to do a different song, but I don't have time for that. So I'm going to say this. God is still on the mountain. I said, God is still on the mountain. But let me tell you how it switched. Let me tell you what changed. It was first the altars 
and then it was mountains. But God wasn't satisfied with that. So the place where his presence would dwell, he said, Moses, I want you to build me an ark. So it went from a mountain they would have to travel miles to, to an ark that would travel with them. So now God's presence went with them wherever they went. But we know the stories. The ark got stolen. The ark was still lost. It was still contained in a box. So look at this. It goes from the altars and mountains to an ark in a box. But then Jesus himself becomes the ark. And the word becomes flesh. And now Jesus is God's walking heaven. He's now literally heaven walks inside of him. He is the dwelling place of all of God's presence. He walks around, everything he touched gets a piece of heaven. Every time he talks, it gets a piece of heaven. Every time he walks, heaven is walking because it's contained no longer in a box, but in the body of Jesus. Listen, <laughs> he dies on a cross. When Jesus dies on a cross, something happens. He's on the cross. No bone was broken in his body. But the soldier came and pierced his side. And the Bible says that when his wound opened up, blood and water flowed out. Why? Because his heart literally burst inside of his chest. When that happens, blood and water intermingle and flow out. God's heart bursts so that yours could be saved. Please understand. Now watch this. When he was pierced in the side... It went from an ark to a box into a body, but his side had to be pierced so that we could now go in and be found in Christ. You see, when the body of Jesus was pierced, the church got to go in. Now I'm not around Christ. I'm now found in Christ. Now watch this. The body was open so the church could now be found in Christ. But then he says, you are now my body. And now the Holy Ghost looked at your hands, your feet. He looked at your mouth. He looked at your eyes. He looked at your dirty brain. And he said, that's my perfect fixer-upper. That's the house. So now we don't have to go to a box. We don't have to go to a mountain. The altar is inside of every single one of us. Listen, listen, listen. The altar, there is a mountain that is inside of every one of our hearts with an altar. It's the altar of the heart. And our high priest, his name is Jesus, is waiting at the altar for you to bring the sacrifice. The high priest whose name is Jesus is waiting at the altar of your heart right now for you to bring a sacrifice. Dude, can I tell you how to start? The Bible says offer up the fruit of your lips, which is the sacrifice of praise. He says, listen, when you praise God, it doesn't count unless it's not something convenient to do. You see, when it's easy to praise, it's not the same. But when it's hard to praise, that's when you light a fire. That's when you start saying, Lord... The high priest is waiting at the altar of your heart right now. Every person around the building. Davon, please come back out. You can start playing. The altar of your heart. The high priest is waiting at the altar of your heart. Abundance has a location. Abundance has a location. It's right here. Job 28, 1 through 8. I'll just read. There is a place. The Bible says, Job describes this place where you can mine silver and have gold refined. They know where to dig iron from the earth, how to smelt copper from rock. This is the secret place. Where they know how to shine light in the darkness and explore the farthest regions of the earth. And so they search the dark for ore. There is a place that the mine shaft sinks so deep into the earth, far from what everyone lives. They descend on ropes, swinging back and forth. Food is grown on the earth, but down below the earth is melted by fire. Here the rocks contain precious lapis lazuli. That was in Ezekiel. The dust contains gold. These are treasures. Listen, no bird of prey can see this place. Who are those? The demons. No falcon's eye can observe it. And no wild animal has ever walked these paths. Listen. The lion himself has never set his paw there. You see, there's a secret place the devil can't find. There's a secret place the devil has never put his foot on. The enemy can't see you there. The enemy can't see you there. You see, you go into the secret place. You go into a cloak of God's love. You go into a place where you can commune with God. 
and unlock abundance, unlock joy, unlock peace, unlock the faith you need for your family, unlock healing. Moses is on the mountain, Exodus 33, I'm closing with this. And he says, God, please show me your glory. God said, I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim my name before you. I will be gracious to whom I may be gracious. I'll show compassion to whom I show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man will see my face and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place. Behold, there is a place. <sighs> right next to me. Stand in that place. On that rock, his name is Jesus. Stand in the place of what Jesus has done for you. Stand in the place of the breakthrough that the cross brought for your family. Stand into the place, not of your own works, not of what you feel you deserve. It has nothing to do with you. It's what Jesus deserves. He says you get to have. Jesus took everything we deserve so that we get what he deserves. Stand on the rock. And he says, I'm going to cover you. This is so powerful. I'm going to cover you with my hand in the cleft of the rock. And I'm going to pass by. When I take away my hand, you're going to see my back. That's the future. Some of y'all are still confused of where you're at because you need to see things to come. But you can't because the back of God is the future. And you're not going to the place where you can hear God. So you're worried just like the world is worried. You're in fear just like your sisters and brothers are. But there's a place God can tell you what's going to happen. He can give you peace. And he says, by my face will not be seen. Every person eyes closed. There's a place. There's a place. Moses stood on a mountain. Waiting for you to pass by. You put your hand over his face So in your presence he wouldn't die All of Israel saw the glory And it shines down through Now you've called me to boldly seek your face. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior right now, he's waiting for you right here at this altar. There's a place that you need to come to right now. The place is this altar where God is waiting for you. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to go home with you tonight. If you don't know Jesus, not one person moving in this place, the presence of God is precious. I don't want you to wait. I want the altar team to come up right now. If you don't know him, I want you to just begin to walk down here right now. Do not be ashamed. Do not worry about anything else. I want you to walk down. Get out of your seat right now and come down. Say, I want Jesus. Come on. Say, I want Jesus. Who's coming? Who needs him? Thank you. He's coming right here. He's coming right here. Give him a hand. Give him a hand as they're starting to come. Say, I want Jesus. There you go. He's coming right here. He's coming right here. Look, let him out of the aisle here. Show me your face. Come on, give a hand to this man right here. Look at this. I was preaching to you the whole service, sir. I was preaching to you the whole service, man. God. In this holy place. Come on, they're still coming up. Give them a hand. Show me your face. Your power and grace. Your power and your grace. Come on, give my hand right here. He's coming. Listen, every person who's standing here, whether you're saying, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus, or you're saying, this is the first time I'm doing this. Maybe you just needed some confirmation and assurance in your heart. You've had doubts. That's great. We welcome you here. This is the time to pray that. Or maybe this is the first time that you've ever prayed it. We're all going to pray a prayer together right now. And then the person in front of you is going to walk off with you and they're going to give you something else. They're going to be talking to you, praying for you for deeper needs. Let's all pray right now. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I receive you as Lord. 
I receive you as Savior. I repent of my sins. I ask that you cleanse me with your blood. I want to be a disciple. I want to be found in you. I want you to go home with me tonight and give me peace. Lord God, I turn over my own life and I release it to you. I surrender. You're the boss. I'm not. Thank you that I'm going to heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Every person, hands raised. Every person, stand to your feet now. Let's stand to our feet. Hands raised up. I could make it to the end. Come on, let's just kiss him. Let's give him a kiss. Give him a kiss for the Thanksgiving tonight. Let's just thank him. Let's just say, Lord God, we just love you. Come on, show me your face. Every hand lifted. I promise we're going to leave. But let's just praise him one more time. Show me your face, Lord. There's a place. There's a place he's waiting. Show me your face. Abundance has a location. Then cut of my legs that I might stand in this whole come on, this holy place. Show me your power, your grace, you need it. Your power, your grace. Come on. I could make it to the end. Precious Jesus, if I could just. Every person looking at me right now. I want to give a blessing to you, but I also want to say something. Listen, there's a place where abundance is found. There's a location. Some of y'all don't have a place you're walking. You don't have a place you go. It could be in your bedroom. It could be on the mountain. I go to a mountain. I like, I have to get out of my house. Some of y'all can't pray in your house. You're going to have to take this seriously. Where is the place you can meet with God? The altar is already in your heart. You could pray right here. You could pray anywhere. But you might have to get away to a place where you can just be with you and God. There is a place where abundance is unlocked. There is a place where all the abundance you need is found. The abundance has a location. Prayer unlocks all of the unlimited of God. It's a principle. Every person, as you look at me, I just want you to know the love of God is calling out to every single one of you. There is a burning bush that you can go home to tonight. If you would rather just shut off the other distractions, because remember, the Holy Spirit will not compete with the other voices in your life. He waits for you to turn those voices down. Some of y'all need his voice right now. You need it for your kids. You need it for your marriage. You need it for your work. You need it. Who needs his voice right now? Come on, we should all be lifting our hands. Then this word was for you. This word is a life-changing word. This word is a marking word. You might be obeying the call. You might answer the phone when your mama calls. You might answer the phone when your sister. But are you answering when God is nudging at your heart? He's pulling you to himself. There's abundance waiting for every single one of you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. I want to say something real quick. Christian, what do I need to announce real quick before we let go? Sunday part two. Sunday part two. Pastor Marco is going to be preaching on Sunday. It's going to be amazing. Remember the last, the last showing of Crossroads is on Sunday night at Pomona. If you want to do that, please go to the app. Guys, there's so many great things coming. We love you. God bless you. Let God's face shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, tell somebody about it. Bring them on Sunday. God bless.